Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We wish that you'll be safe in your own environment and not at the Yacht Club until we can have everybody back in our beautiful grill room and Yacht Club after this pandemic passes us. It's been here way too long and we all miss being with each other, but we're thankful for the Zoom technology, which allows us to continue our Wednesday Yachting Lunch. And our guest today is very appropriate for this pandemic. Uh, she is in fact a PhD, MD, board certified dermatologist. And she can speak to us about sunscreen sailors and the dermatological manifestations of COVID-19, including a new term we're all hearing, mask need. And that is a, a rash that you get from having a mask on your face all the time. So with that, I'm very happy to welcome Edith Olas Harkin. Edith, fun to see you again and fun to have you here and feel you have such expertise. In. Thank you, uh, Ron. Uh, it is such a pleasure and I'm really honored to have this invitation. I'm looking forward to give this talk. San Francis Yacht Club is one of my favorites and I have great memories from the, uh, the America's Cup and CIGP and we've met there. So, and I really cherish our friendship. So thank you again. Just if you're curious, that little girl with the mask is Bill Goggins, Harkin CEO's uh, daughter. So this is a recent little race. We are a little bit better here in Wisconsin. So we have races for the kids, but with a lot of social distancing, no gatherings, uh, but the kids are wearing masks. So she is very cute. Nori is her name. So her boat's name is instead of finding Dory, it's finding Nori. So it's, I really like that. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's a great sentence. Okay, so I have a few disclosures. Uh, number one is I, uh, I have a secret that I happen to uh, be uh, married to Peter Harkin. So my whole uh, sailing connection uh, with, um, with the sailing world is through Peter, although I grew up sailing in our lake. Uh, we have a big lake. If you wonder about my accent, I'm from Hungary. So we have a big lake and I, grew, I spent my summers there. We had a house, so I sailed a lot there. But through my travels with Peter, uh, I noticed the issues with, with, the, with sunscreen. People didn't really know what kind of sunscreen to use. And, and as a matter of fact, I put Jimmy on this picture because he was my sort of final inspiration, the redhead Aussie with a with lot of, you know, sort of high risk of skin cancer discussion with him to finally start this uh, skincare line for sailors called Hark and Durham. And I'm very proud that uh, the U.S. sailing team is um, using this. Um, and uh, it's quite a trip, I tell you that. I'm primarily still a dermatologist. If you want to read a little bit of the story, how Harkenderm started, this is a recent article at uh, Seahorse magazine, actually from this year, May or June. And um, this is my second article here, but this is more about the story, about our discussion and why, why he helped me to start the company basically. But today I'd like to talk to you about why sunscreen is such a hot topic and, it, uh, and then why ingredients in your sunscreen really matter, uh, the human safety, the coral safety, and somewhat of what my recommendations. I have to tell you that uh, I'm a Wisconsin uh, representative for the American Academy of um, Dermatology. I'm very involved with a lot of professional societies. But what I'm telling today is very much my personal and professional opinion. So I don't represent any organization with my advice. And that's very important because it's an extremely contentious topic. I did promise Ron, I'm not going to mention the name hydroquino, but, but this is uh, yeah, hydroxychloroquine, but it's almost, it used to be as contentious, you know, now it's taken over by some other topics. Okay, so <laughs> sailors. So I don't know whether you recognize who this person is, but this is actually Dick Stern, who happens to be my patient. Dick was a star champion, world champion, and, um, and also a silver medalist in 1964 in Japan and the Olympics. So Dick happens to be my patient. And on the left side, you see this panel that he is riddled with skin cancer. 
and I'm taking care of him, but um, obviously Dick is at that age that he did not even use sunscreen or if he used something, it's called suntan lotion, okay? So we know I don't have to really explain to you that you guys, um, sailors, you are extremely high risk because it's kind of triple pleasure that also a triple threat for you and sun is number one, but all the wind and water also kind of uh, wreaks havoc on your skin. So, and UV light is extremely carcinogenic. You know that, so about 65 to 90% of melanomas are attributable to UV exposure. And almost 100% of the other big category, the basal cells and the squamous cell carcinomas, we used to call them non-melanoma skin cancers, but now I prefer keratinocyte cancers because they're coming from a skin cells. They're really caused by UV light. So, so of course, the UV light is not, is, is, has different rays and the UVB is about only just 5%, but those are the burning rays and those are, that cause mainly the burning and the cancer. And the UVA lights are the more longer wavelength lights and they're also <clears throat> can cause cancers. That's what in the tanning booth and actually they cause cancers, but because they go deep in the dermis, they're mainly responsible for aging through an oxidative stress. Now, the other player in the UV spectrum is UV C light. And I bring this up again, UV C light is very carcinogenic. Why I'm bringing this up? Because we have, we had a guy who is not really an expert, but in a very high leadership position who recently mentioned to actually use UV C light on ourselves and in my in our mouth and so to kill COVID, okay? So, and the side here in this shows that UV light is carcinogenic. So I, this is my hands full with COVID here. I said, no, 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 no. So, but I'd like to explain to you that, that UVC is basically a germicidal light. Um, and this is the, the, it's 254 nanometer. It's not that important, but what they use for killing uh, um, viruses, including it kills COVID on the surfaces, but it is actually very, very dangerous for, especially for the eyes, it causes cataract and it can cause skin cancer. But just a recent study was published literally this month from Columbia University and there was another group in Japan or China that showed that there is a so-called far UVC, which is 222 uh, nanometers and uh, uh, it's, so it's further down um, in, the, in the spectrum is also can cause uh, or kill coronaviruses. They haven't tested uh, COVID yet, or, um, uh, but, but it is actually such a light that it's absorbed in the tear layer. So the very, just in our own tears and also absorbed in the, in the dead layer of the skin. So this is a really great new development because instead of using those traditional um, kind of mer mercury germicidal light, UVC lights, now we have a new kind of uh, wavelength that may be very, very useful and maybe even can use when humans are around in this room. So this is just kind of a, a UV light and COVID um, connection. So. I told you, you know that UV light causes uh, um, uh, skin, skin cancer. And we know from Australia, from their very famous slip, slop, slap, seek, seek and slide uh, campaign that, <coughs> that um, sun protection drastically, drastically, uh, basically reduced their skin cancer and melanoma rate. It was a fantastic study. So today, Beside uh, promoting all the other sun smart behaviors, what is listed here, I just, I really want to talk to you about sunscreen. It's my passion. I, I really think I know a lot about sunscreen. And I realized throughout, again, my trips with Peters and being on the boats that people had no idea of, about sunscreens. Uh, I mean, they were like, really, you know, I, when I turned out I was a dermatologist, I got more questions from sunscreen about sunscreen from people than Peter's about winches. So he was starting to get a little jealous. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, 
so let me let me talk about why why is is it such a hot topic and i'll give you a little bit of a timeline okay so 2008 may and that was actually the same time we launched our sunscreen um there is this new ban came out from thailand to ban two ingredients oxybenzone and octin oxide starting 2021 and it, it's sunscreens usually expire in two, two years. So that's why they kind of, it's a later start point. And then Palau and Key West and a lot of other kind of uh, um, areas, um, you, the US Virgin Island uh, basically followed suit. Then uh, articles came out that sunscreen chemicals found in, in Bay, Chesapeake Bay oysters, so, and then subsequently, and I will talk to about the FDA, the FDA came out in 2019, uh, it's new kind of um, OTC sunscreen monograph proposal. And this proposal created a huge buzz because it was talking about certain ingredients that are safe, certain ingredients are not safe, so it was the, exactly the time as my academy meeting. So as in the middle of it, Tyson, it became a huge battle and very controversial topics and lobbying with, between industry, uh, FDA, dermatologists, and so on. So there were a lot of articles about it. And this article in was sent to me by all my friends that is sunscreen not the new margarine because sunscreen is harming us more than her, uh, than helping us and so on. So again, very, very, very hot topic. Uh, uh, so I will tell you what happened and I will tell you the data. And again, it's my opinion, it's not a professional organizational opinion, okay? So the right, right picture here, this is a picture I took on one of the boats I sailed a while ago and this is what you find you go on a boat and there's like all these sunscreen either in a basket or in a drawer or on a table half of them are expired how are you going to make a choice how do you know what you're using is right and this is again it saves lives it's a very important important um over-the-counter drug that i don't think people know really what they're using so um do you know what it, what's in your sunscreen? And I ask people all the time, do you know, do you know how, to, how to distinguish what you're using is right or wrong? Well, in America, we are actually pretty lucky because the um, Food and Drug Administration requires on the labeling to separate the active ingredients from the inactive ingredients. So if you look at the back of these labels, you see that we actually can find our active ingredients and those are the UV filters. As opposed to Europe, uh, where, where sunscreens are not regulated as a drug, uh, I tell you that ingredients are listed based on their concentration in, the, in that um, product. So guess what? It always starts with aqua, so water, and somewhere in the middle, the ingredients are hidden. So I gave a talk to my colleagues in Barcelona last year about this. And I tell you that Europe, European dermatologists are even less now knowledgeable sometimes because they have no clue how to find those ingredients. On top of it, I gotta tell you that there's different names in the, in, in the US and different names in Europe. And the names are extremely difficult to pronounce and remember. So, so, so again, what I would like to tell you why ingredients matter and why you have to turn around your tube or your bottle and look what you're using. Why does it matter? Because what you're using, these active ing ingredients are going to basically uh, prevent you from the UV light that has biological effect. So the UVB is mainly what's causing burning, UVB causes and UVA tanning, and then there is the UVA that causes a lot of oxidative damage through free radicals and causes aging. And then both the UVB and the far UVA light cause immunosuppression locally in your skin. So it's very important because that's one reason you shouldn't be on the light when you had melanoma because it's locally decreases your immune defense around your melanoma or old melanoma. And if you have any cells that escape, you don't want your immune system to be suppressed. So 
If you look at this uh, chart, this shows that certain filters cover the f almost the full spectrum of UVA and UVB light as opposed to, and these are the so-called mineral filters. And I will explain to you the zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. But in the United States, chemical filters or the rest of the filters do not cover the full spectrum. So you have to put them together like a puzzle. So you kind of put things together in order to cover the full spectrum. So you always see a lot of these chemical filters together in a, in a formulation in order to give you broad spectrum. As opposed to- Edith, I have a quick, so go back one slide. Yes. So you say uh, a careful purchaser, customer would look at what is needed and say, I want a little bit of this ingredient, a little bit of that active ingredient. But wouldn't one postulate that you've put together the correct active ingredient combination or others that you recommend have put together good combinations? Isn't there one sunscreen that has the appropriate coverage for a person going outside, going sailing in a sunny day? Ooh, Ron, that's a very complex question. Uh, <clears throat> so. Okay. Uh, uh, yes, you 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 would you would think that people, the manufacturer of the sunscreens <coughs> will put will give you the best best coverage possible. The, the there are two issues. One is this that no, uh, probably three issues. One is the SPF only measures UVB, okay? Because SPF is measured by bur. They're looking at how much you can burn with or without the sunscreen. So and. And it doesn't really measure the UVA protection, which still can give you skin cancer and still can give you aging. The other problem is that there is some cosmetic um, sort of uh, uh, consequences of what you're using. Those filters that are really good right now in the United States, sorry, I went somehow back. So those titanium dioxide, they are white. So it's, they have that white cast, so it's, and I tell you, they're very, very expensive and difficult to formulate in a cosmetically elegant formula. So if you want those filters, it's going to be a more, more expensive sunscreen, as opposed to the chemical filters are very, very cheap and much easier to formulate. So they are, they're, they're much, easier to, to, to basically, it's cheaper and easier, and they're cosmetically more elegant because more transparent. But there are issues with those chemical filters, which I'm gonna talk about. And also sometimes, the, in the United States, we have only one chemical filter called avobenzone, which actually covers UVA light appropriately. So don't even buy anything else that doesn't have, if it's chemical avobenzone, so it's hard to really have a very good spectrum with chemical filters. Go ahead. Unless you're in Europe, because Europe, uh, unfortunately, not unfortunately, fortunately for European, unfortunately for us, uh, that we don't have these, they have very good so-called second generational filters. And the second generational, fin also Tinosorb S, which I think will be the first one which comes in here if they bring them in. Uh, because it's a very large molecule, so it's not absorbed. So the, these are uh, these are very excellent, excellent filters. And unfortunately, we do not have them in the United States. Wait, which one, when you say you say excellent filter, which of those on the chart are you saying? Okay, those it, two rows. Okay. Yeah. So Tinosorb and Maxoril Exa, and um, the, what, the, I don't know why the Tinosorb S is not in there. But okay. Tinosorb S, um, they're both BSF, and the Maxoril Exal is a L'Oreal um, patent, so the only L'Oreal will be able to bring it in. Um, but Tinosorb S, I, if I put my horses on something, it's gonna be Tinosorb S, because it's an excellent, excellent uh, broad spectrum filter, and it's a very large molecule, so meaning, uh, that it it just by sheer physical properties it cannot be absorbed in the blood and absorption is a very big deal right now for the fda so i am assuming that just by the, its physical properties it can come in without some te those testing i i'm just saying that in between 
the million of uh, whoever listening to this, you know, but <laughs> I think it's going to be Tino Sorb S, hopefully. Good. Got it. So, so, so again, um, this is like a dogma, although it's not, nothing is like black and white in biology, but what we say that physical sunscreens, so the, the mineral sunscreens, they are reflect the UV rays. So as long as they sit on the top of your skin, they will work. Now I gotta tell you, they also absorb them. And I also gotta tell you that the more micronized they get or even nano sized, they are kind of absorb them more. So they're not just reflect, but this is easier for most of the people to understand why the chemical sunscreen, they absorb the light and they go through a conformational change and they also create some heat on the surface because they turn the, UV, the, the energy of the photon to, to um, thermal energy. And, um, and some of them, because they're changed, they also can be very um, deactivated by the sun. So that is one of the problem with them. Okay, so one more time, it's kind of showing how zinc oxide has the breast coverage. Titanium dioxide is a very good UVB filter, covers a bit of UVA. Oxybenzone, I'll talk, talk to you. This is actually covers a good range of B, a little bit of A, but it's not a perfect filter. The rest of our chemical filters are all B and avobenzone is the A and the shirt is the best sunscreen you can have. And I tell that to my patient. And again, it's just for fun fact, Ron, guess what? Which shirt is the best for, for sunscreen? Long sleeve. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But actually jeans. <laughs> ah, really? So can we go back to that chart? Where yeah. Carcinogenic, which is worse for you? The um, 290, um bandwidth or the 400 from the left to the right which is worse for yes definitely this one here for carcinogenesis okay okay so okay, this is it. going but if you're using a uva tanning booth you can you know it increases your risk of melanoma uva increases the risk of skin cancer by an oxidative induced stress but for real carcinogenesis, definitely UVB. And that's what SPF actually matter, uh, measures, okay? Okay, got it, okay. Um, but still, if you don't wanna get the, be a wrinkly sailor, then, then you should use the UVA protection too. And okay. again, it co does cause skin cancer. So let's talk about safety. And this is Popeye, you know, again, it's like, this is a, this has been a really like, okay, what the heck is going on? We have no idea. Uh, this is a, kind of became a very new topic. So a little bit about how this, how, what happened with the FDA and why we have such a problem with sunscreen in this country and we don't have those good sunscreens I mentioned. So again, sunscreen is, is regulated as an over-the-counter drug, but you can get without prescription. And uh, and the original, the, most of the sunscreens were grandfathered in in the 70s. So there were no testing, no ruling. Now, it was 1987 when the term SPF was kind of created as sun protection factor and the FDA told how to measure it. The 1997 was the last ingredient was ever been tested and allowed in, as a sunscreen in the ingredient that was avobenzone and that's that UVA filter, and then later, actually, L'Oreal brought in Maxoril, um, um, which is one of the Maxorils, um, uh, SX, uh, or no, S SM, uh, that it brought it in as a new drug, the drug application, so only they can use it, only they can use it in a certain combination with ev avobenzone and oct oct octocrine. No other companies can use that ingredient. So 1999, when the FDA came out with their first sunscreen monograph, and 11, they had the final rule labeling. And, <clears throat> and then the Congress is getting really upset because there were eight of these very good ingredients from Europe were pending for application uh, since basically 2002 to 2009 and nothing happened. So the Congress enacted this so-called um, Sunscreen Innovation Act and they said the FDA has five years 
to come up with the final monograph and bring in these filters. So five years expired, actually 2019, November, and, uh, and uh, 2019, February was when the, when the FDA came up with this kind of proposed monograph. And it's created a huge uproar, okay? Why is that? If you go down there, because they said um, that only certain ingredients, only the mineral ingredients are generally recognized as safe and effective. So zinc dioxide and titanium dioxide, two ingredients they mixed and the, all the rest of the chemical filters, they said that there is insufficient data for use in sunscreen. So the issue was that it created a big uproar because they said uh, people thought they were not safe and not effective, you know? And they're effective, we know we've been using them for a long time, but the FDA questioned their safety. <coughs> they did a lot of other things, what they wanted to change, um, discontinue powders, changing SPF 50 to SPF 60, and so on and so on. But this was the biggest deal and the industry was up in arms and crazy about this. And tell you the dermatologists, most of the dermatologists split, some totally agreed and some, to some sided with industry, but most of uh, we were really afraid that this will trigger those articles such as is sunscreen the new margarine and people will stop using sunscreen and it will create a new epidemic of skin cancer. So at the end, we were kind of afraid. So what are we talking about? Mainly, we are scared about oxybenzone. And oxybenzone is not only in sunscreen, but in a ton of other ingredients that has some SPF in it. So, <clears throat> so moisturizers, makeup, <coughs> foundation. So a lot of people are exposed to sunscreen or the oxybenzone. And then the FDA, as a matter of fact, itself hired researchers and said, you guys, you don't wanna do these studies. We've been asking you to do these absorption studies. We're gonna do it on our own. So what happened is they did these so-called MUST studies, which, is, um, which stands for um, Maximal Usage Trial. So what they decided, okay, so our guidelines is to use a sunscreen and reapply it, reapply it every two hours. So if a person goes out on the beach, in Hawaii for a full week of vacation and they will follow the guidelines and they're using a sexy bikini or then they will apply that sunscreen 75% of their body surface every two hours. So that's what they did. And this is a lot of sunscreen application. And this was a one, one major um, sort of a problem what, what people who were questioning this study brought up that nobody applies sunscreen 75% of the body surface every two hours, four times a day for four days. But so this is what they did. This is a complicated site and I, I don't wanna go through this. I just kind of look at it from far away. All I wanna show that the FDA says that anything which is above 0 0.5 nanogram per milliliter <coughs> concentration, which is this line here, you know, okay. uh, has to be studied. Okay. That is anything below is, I, we don't care about it, it's such a, a minuscule amount. And if you look at these, they studied four ingredients, especially oxybenzone, and way off the chart, way it gets absorbed extremely quickly. Okay. So because people were, were saying nobody applies sunscreen this many times, they did another study and this just got published early this year. They used uh, more subject and they used more sunscreen, more different formulations. <coughs> and what they did, they applied the sunscreen day one only once and they measured it. And then day two, three, four, they, they applied it four times. So they wanted to know how is what, if you guys are questioning, it's too many application, what happens only with one application? Again, I, we shouldn't give, go through it, but it, this is only one application. Only one application, all, all of the tested sunscreens were above the allowed limit in one application. And then even after four, even higher. So 
basically the FDA said, you guys, we're going to have to figure this out. There is definitely absorption. It doesn't mean that because it's absorbed, it's not safe. We've been using this sunscreens for a long time, but people are using much more sunscreen than in the past. Uh, skin care awareness is very good, thanks for, to dermatologists. And we, we want to know what's happening with people in the blood. And, and there are some hormo known hormonal effects of oxybenzone. And I will show you the, through this, the coral, but it definitely affects humans as well. So the final ruling, was as a, as based on that um, Sunscreen Innovation Act, was supposed to be finished November 26, uh, 19, 2019, uh, so last November. And then it's postponed right now for we, um, probably next year because there were so many public comments. There's so much of a battle between the industry. And so it's still not, we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but it's definitely an issue, a big, big issue. So um, let's talk about the reefs a bit, a bit because again, uh, this became a very big, big contentious issue. Reminds me a little bit of global warming. There is a lot of totally good data that, that uh, uh, you know, carbon monoxide dioxide uh, emission does matter. And, but people say, oh, you know, we have a big earth and concentration is not high enough. And there is, it become, it became very much politicized. This so in, let me, let me pause for a second. So uh, in terms of big buckets from 50,000 feet, what you've been talking about is the um, effect of sunscreens on humans. Yes. You're pointing out that we need them, they help us. But you're also pointing out that because different chemicals in sunscreens are absorbed into our body at bigger and faster rates, that we have to be careful about them and be very careful about reading our ingredients. And you've been thoughtful and thorough. And in, everybody knows with the Wednesday Yachting Luncheons, you can rewind and go back and look at something that you want to cover more than once. Thank you uh, for Zoom being able to do that. And now you're saying second big bucket is, okay, so that's so much about what sunscreens do on human beings. Now you're saying, what about their effect on the environment? And first off, reefs. I got the picture. Yes. yes. So, and actually, to tell you the truth, this is kind of like came from two arms and both came in the same and, 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 and peaked both the environmental arm and the human arm from 2018 and 2019. <clears throat> so, so why do reef matters? And I don't have to give about the a lecture, but basically it's only covers 1% of the ocean floor, but gives 25% uh, a home for 25% of the marine life. Economically, they're, they're, they're worth trillions of dollars. They're very important for us and, and for the oceans. And of course, bleaching has been a problem. And, and we know one of the major cause of bleaching is temperature increase and pollution. Um, and, and this is what is, of course, one of the issue that, that um, people don't believe in sunscreen harming the corals. They, they say it's everything else but the sunscreen. What bleaching is actually is that basically the zeocentrally uh, live symbiotic relationship with algae, with the coral, and then, and then they're when, when the coral gets bleached, they leave the coral. So, because these are these little algae that gives the color for the color and then the coral, and then they leave and then the coral becomes white. Now there is a spot if then there is this the spot of no return, but before that actually they can go back, repopulate the coral and then the coral can uh, grow and, and live again. So wait, let me pause for a second. So what you're mm -hmm. saying is that when we see a colorful coral, yeah. that is that color comes from uh, the algae which is living on it and yeah. it's existing in the colony on top of this uh, bony substance which is the coral. And then what happens is the temperature stress may kill or uh, kill the algae. And when the algae leaves, the coral that's left it didn't get the color didn't get transformed. It's just that you expose the underlying color of the coral and that's what looks like bleached coral. Is that correct? Yes, exactly what happens. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. So, so, so 
there's some data, there is a ton of sunscreen that enters the water around the reefs and it's really around the reefs because that's where people are snorkeling and diving and, and it comes off the coral. But of course, just with global warming, it's about the concentration. So basically for po the particle concentration in the big ocean. So um, there are some bays that they did a lot of testing, St. John and Trunk Bay was one of them because Trunk Bay had a, all the coral disappeared and they found, and it's, it's a horseshoe shaped bay, of course, so the, the sunscreen concentration can really go up. And if, you, if, if you've been to these beaches, you know that you see that oily substance basically swimming on the top of the, the, <clears throat> the water, that's mo most likely co uh, sunscreen. And then Hawaii, they did a ton of studies in Hawaii. Never, they all found high enough concentration uh, in these bays that in laboratory environment, in basically a, in, in a, in a tank environment would kill the coral, okay? So, so the concentration was big enough, but this is the most contentious topic. And this is what is attacked all the time that people who don't believe in it that coral, that sunscreen hurts the coral. They don't believe the concentration is high enough. Nobody actually fights that in the laboratory, if you put enough sunscreen ingredients in a tank uh, or, or do all these biological experiments that, that uh, it will kill the coral. And, and basically it, it just stops the DNA for uh, kind of replication. It deforms the young coral but not just the coral is a problem. For example, fish, it can decrease the fertility and reproduction. So I always tell it's like a hormonal, like a birth control uh, pill for fish. You know, uh, Ron, there are those fish that can change their gender based yes. on, the, based on how, whether they have to be the male or the female on that um, uh, group of fish. And they all may, um, became female and they cannot change back to males. Okay, so, so muscle is a big problem, but we can, can induce that defects in the young muscles, sea urchins. So there is a lot of marine biologists that study this. And I actually talked to Noah uh, and talked to the coral representative, coral researchers, and they absolutely have a vast amount of data and research accumulated that in a laboratory environment, definitely these ingredients are very, very harmful. So the question is right now of the concentration. <coughs> but again, um, uh, I, what I tell my patients when they're asking this question, that if we know that something harms the coral, even, even, even if it's only in the laboratory environment, I, and there are other sunscreen ingredients that are safe, I want them to use a safe, the safe ingredient. So this is my answer. And this is still, going up, they just overturned the ban in Key West, so there is a lot of lobbying, okay? So the other thing is the, the spray sunscreens, just one little blurb about that. We dermatologists hate it, although that's the number one formulation which is sold in this country, but they did measure that spray can uh, travel like 450 meters. So the issue is that and it goes in your lung and you inhale it and it travels far away. And so we really don't like the spray sunscreen. So what you're saying is that uh, one of the form factors for application of sunscreen uh, is a spray, but you're saying the danger with spray is, one, you can breathe it, get it inside your lungs. And what's another danger of spray? The other danger, the application that there is, for example, this uh, little, you know, window I have in my slide. This is yeah. when you just boop, boop, run after your kids, you know, and you just spray, spray, spray. You and don't rub it in and you don't distribute it. This may happen. So right. the problem with spray that you just half of what you spray is not on the body. Uh, it's, if you don't rub it in, it's just, it's, it seems like an easy thing application but it's not efficacious enough got it and it travels far and then you can inhale it yes so our viewers who do use a spray even if we can't dissuade them from doing so the, the key is 
don't let don't overspray and be careful to rub it in after it's on your skin. Or you can overspray. I mean, you can spray as much, the more you spray, the better it is. But spray it close to your skin and rub it in, or spray it in your hands and then rub it in, and don't like just do it like a hairspray. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Okay, so so one more thing I want to mention here too, kind of on the side a bit, but but beside that, you know, again, zinc oxide and titanium dioxide, now we know are reef friendly, that for the longest time, dermatologists always told mothers and fathers that do not apply any chemical sunscreens on your children. And this has been, you know, we always said that. So, so why did we say that? Because we always knew that there is some hidden potential hormonal effect. So, so when you, for example, buy a baby sunscreen or buy a, a sunscreen for sensitive skin, it's always these mineral filters. So this is another indication that there's a reason you're going to have to watch out for those chemical sunscreens. Got it. Okay. So again, what is my advice? Turn around the bottle. Okay. Look at of the front on the bottle, you look at the SPF. I say use a 50 as a sailor because nobody uses enough sunscreen. Not, you never use as much as they test the sunscreen with. So the 50 probably is a 30 SPF when you apply it. So the highest is the better. Right now, United States, the FDA only lets you say 50 or 50 plus. Even if you test and your test comes out 80 SPF, you can't put it on your bottle. Those bottles you see are, are old ones or you're not allowed to say actually has SPF 100. You're only allowed to say SPF 50 or 50 plus. SPF is kind of a, a curve which flattens down. So the difference between a 50 and 100 is so little. It's 0.005% that it's not, it's misleading for the public to think that you can actually, that's double as strong. So remind us again, the acronym SPF is Sun Protection Factor. What is it? Sun, sun Protection Factor. It's measured by, you measure the time uh, you can stay out without burning, uh, with, without, when it, how long does it take for you to burn? without the sunscreen and with the sun divided by with the sunscreen so what happens is they in the they they actually test this still in humans okay this is they take these people volunteers they radiate them with uvb light they put the sunscreen on and they radiate them with different basically um quantities of of uh, doses of uvb light and they measure the, their erythema so <clears throat> the issue is that they measure the erythema. It's erythema all... is redness. I'm sorry. When they get get pink, okay. So the yeah. the first time you get pink is the it's called the medium erythema dose. So they measure that. When is that first? They literally run. They put little windows on you, and they 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 put different doses of of uh, of UV light, okay, on you. Yeah. So, so but. It is a very interesting thing because we only say that, that um, for example, a th an SPF 15 um, blocks 93% of UVB light, an SPF 30 blocks 97, and an SPF 50 blocks about 98.5. So then you say, well, there is no difference really between the 30 and the 50, 97, 98.5. <clears throat> it's kind of true, but what I say to people that reverse it, there is 100 UVB rays getting into your skin. If you use a, you use a, um, a 30, there are three rays still going through and causing cancers. If you use a 50, there are only one and a half rays. So cumulatively, if you go out and you're out there from 10 o'clock to three o'clock, so five hours, strong sun, every millisecond there is a UVB ray hitting you, that it means like your exposure is doubled between a 30 and the, and the 50, you know, about the 50. So that's how you have to think about that. So instead of, instead of three rays, you know, you can decrease it one and a half rays, and that that uh, reduction does matter. So uh, I'm look. I love looking at your label over here. It says broad spectrum. 
You mean the UV spectrum and the UVB spectrum? Is that what you mean by that? No, broad spectrum means that it both covers not just UVB light, but also UVA light. That's uh -huh. broad and spectrum. That's good. That's a favorite. That, that's a good one. And anything that is a 50 is supposed to be broad spectrum. But I tell you that <clears throat> some sunscreens don't have a very good UVA coverage. You don't burn, but you still get that grayish tan and you still get the aging grays. So it can be misleading. Some sunscreens have a high SPF, but still not very good UVA coverage. And you don't really know about it because you don't burn and you think, oh, you have a very good sunscreen. It's a very, I could talk about in another hour, how you measure UVA. Uh, Europe measures it differently than we do, than Japan. Water resistance, that is measured in the whirlpool. So they basically put you in a whirlpool for 20 minutes um, and four times, and then you just can tap tower and then they will measure your UV uh, SPF again. I always say for sailors, use water resistant and if possible, 80 minutes, why? Because, because you sweat, the water is splashing on your face, um, and it is just most of the sunscreens that are not water resistant, they don't last in that environment, okay? So you have to use a water resistant sunscreen. So this is the front, and then you turn it around, although the new proposal by the FDA says the active ingredients should be in the front, which I would like that, and then turn it around and you look at the bottle and you look for the active ingredients. And again, my preference is you look for something that has zinc oxide and titanium dioxide or just zinc oxide. I would not use a sunscreen with only titanium dioxide because it doesn't give you sufficient UVA coverage. <clears throat> and then you, all these warnings, all the bottles are the same. And then there is a little bit of difference in the active ingredients, but that needs a lot of sophistication to understand but what I want to emphasize are antioxidants, and those are sometimes in the bottles on the front to all oh, we have antioxidants. And they're very good because they actually cut down that damage, that free radical induced oxidative damage that is uh, caused by the UVA light. So Harkin Derm has antioxidants, and they're very, very, very good. Um, right. And then why is that important? Because think about your skin a little, little bit like a steak. It keeps cooking once you take it off the grill. I resemble this <laughs> remark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so this is how we look sometimes when we get off the boat, huh? When we don't use sunscreen. Exactly. <laughs> so, so especially people who are white and they don't have a good, they have this very special melanin, the like Jimmy, the red um, field melanin. Those people go on and they damage their own skin for long, even after they get off the sun. So, so putting an antioxidant on your skin after you get off the sun is also very, very important. And for sailors, it's important to put in something which rich in lipids, so you repair that barrier from the wind. Imagine the skin is like brick and mortar, especially the upper layer is brick and mortar. Brick are your skin cells especially the upper layer of cornea sites and the, and the mortar is the lipid that glues it together. So okay. wind and, and salty water and all these basically damage that brick and mortar and they get leaky and that's why your skin gets rough and dry. <clears throat> so what you wanna do is replenish that mortar. So you basically use this and the best things for that <coughs> Are, are emollients. Emollients are the one that kind of seep in and then replenish those, those mortar. Um, um, so linoleic acid and, and all these very good um, lipid containing ingredients. Um, and then, and it's very, very important to seal your skin back after a long day out on the water. Because if you don't do that, um, it's, the, it's the night when actually the skin has a circadian rhythm, just like a lot of other organs in our body. And the, and the skin closes down during the day. It's like shuts down. I'm just protecting myself. I'm not doing any re work because it's in a, in a defense mode. At night, the skin opens up and breathes and repairs. And, and that's when you that's when you get most of for your money when you put in really active ingredients. So you have to use that overnight period for your skin to repair itself. 
And those, those lipids and those moisturizers are very important. So what I've heard you say is that in addition to having some kind of filter on top of your skin to protect your skin mm -hmm. from the UV, et cetera, that you're saying also after you've been in the sun, that feeling that I get every time I go sailing when I come home, that's that you're saying that the mortar between uh, my skin cells has evaporated or been wor uh, worn away. Damaged, yes. Damage. I need to replace it, repair it. Yes. What I do is I take a shower and I tell my wife, she knows just what I'm going to go do, take a shower. Then I put a bunch of you know, moisturizer on my skin and that's repairing what you call the mortar uh, on your skin, which has been sort of damaged. That's what you're yes. saying. So not, not only should people put sunscreen on when they go out, but they have to take care of themselves after they've been in the sun as well. This is, this is, if something I'd like to have basically um, sort of teach today is that is a very important concept. And that's why I call it the morning protection, evening repair. Okay, and that's where Jim is Spithill and read that article, but basically sat down with me and said, you know what, I'm, I'm an Aussie, I've been on the water, I know I need to use sunscreen, but can you tell me what to put on my skin when I get off the sun? And that's what like, wow, I mean, people don't think about that. And men, you know, and I thought men don't care. They all don't want any lotions. But for you guys, sailors, it is as important, I think, as sunscreen. Well, no, no, but almost as important as sunscreen to basically three ingredients in this um, uh, evening repair. A, a barrier repair, so all these rich lipids. Uh, antioxidants which will help to again help that uh, the uva induced oxidative aging rays and repairs your skin and some anti-inflammatory ingredients and usually antioxidants are also anti-inflammatory because all this damage causes a low grade inflammation in your skin that's why you're red you feel like you know that's an in low grade inflammation so so those ingredients are very important and unfortunately some ingredients that dermatologists love, 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 like retinoic acid, it's a vitamin A type ingredient that is fantastic for collagen production and anti-aging, maybe not a good ingredient for sailors because, because it makes your skin a little bit more sensitive to sun. So this is, I, I, I unfortunately, like I named this after sun as after sun and then I, I i realized later on that i made a mistake because people think it's a glorified expensive aloe vera you know and they <laughs> think it's for when i get burned i'm like i hope you don't get burned with hark and germ so i should have just say like evening repair for sailors but 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 this is this is i try to under, make people understand that i created this because this is a two-step solution and you you both need both for for be as handsome as ron right now <laughs> at his age <laughs> so okay. um wonderful so basically one more time, and not the, like this guy. You don't end up, you don't end up with like a <laughs> salty sailor, you know? So, um, and again, you know, I, uh, so all of it, I wanted to basically tell you that these human safety studies are ongoing, but certain chemical filters may be helpful. Zinc is, is in the United States, and please understand, in the United States and on white skin, white skin is much more high risk for skin cancer. Zinc is um, oxide, is still right now my favorite ingredient to use. Ah, that looks like the COVID-19. Yeah, so <laughs> you asked me to a little bit talk about the, the kind of a cutaneous manifestation. So skin, how, what COVID does with the skin without uh, just one second, uh, mentioned to you that um, race and and rationalizing uh, dermatology literature is actually re uh, affecting us as well. This article was just published and it's an interesting article. They went through all the publication, only 49 in May, but by, by now, end of July, there are over 400 publications of um, of what COVID can look like and what COVID does to the skin. And then, uh, hold on, I have to check or have to 
So, and I gotta tell you that 92% of these pictures were of white people. So in our dermatology literature, unfortunately, we also have a big problem of, of uh, not having uh, black skin represented appropriately because you know even with COVID, 13% of US population is uh, black and um, although and 34 percent of um, people of death is right now affecting black people so so we have a problem in dermatology as well and we're trying to correct that but that said uh, the, the cutaneous manifestations are extremely variable um and they're ever changing uh, but you get it about uh, five to 20% of the time. And interestingly, you get it sometimes even 15 days later after your symptoms started or even after any other symptoms subsided. So you can get these kind so wait, of- Wait, would you pronounce yes. this called morbilliform rash? Yeah, morbilliform is, is called, it's this maculopapular. So it's like little red uh, dots and little red bumps on the trunk. And this, this is, this is a symptom of someone who's suffering. Yeah, so you can see that with COVID, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then this, this, uh, this, I'm not sure, probably you, this is the one thing you heard about it. They even call them COVID toes and COVID fingers. So these are like almost like frostbite type of uh, uh, picture. It's a little bit of an inflammation of those tiny vessels, sorry, tiny vessels of your skin. But Ron, just as with anything else, all the treatments, all the information is ever changing. And now just two weeks ago, there was a publication that maybe this is not really associated with COVID, but we see them a lot. So it's still up in the air, but this created a lot of buzz in the, in, in the news, you know, these kind of so-called COVID toes. And then so you can see hives, lots of hives. Um, and then you can see, sorry, I didn't realize I'm showing all these um, interesting body parts. <laughs> but for us, it's very, you know, I don't even see these. I just see the skin. And then uh -huh. you can see these um, called purpura. It's a little bit bleeding into your skin. Uh -huh. And it's very common with COVID comes around the <coughs> folds and the lower trunk and the buttock area. So we've seen that. I've seen this actually myself. Uh -huh. And then sometimes you get these kind of chicken pox like little blistery eruptions too. So uh, wow. that's rare, but you can definitely get that. I'm, I'm realizing I haven't seen any of these dermatological manifestations of COVID. Well, I mean, because yeah. none of them are life-threatening, to tell you the truth. And, and they're very, very polymorph well not polymorphic but they're so different there's it's not like with covid you only see this type of eruption if we'd seen that then that would be probably a bigger news because that would be a diagnostic feature but uh -huh. because we have all kinds of different rashes what we see with other viral uh, like coxsackie virus can parvo virus can cause you know chicken uh, we have other viruses causing rashes like that that's why it's not that big of a deal but in our literature we do report on it probably the biggest was is <coughs> which came out because there's so so much about oh children's are not affected children's can get sick children's don't transmit the virus and all those things people you know came in the news this uh, so-called multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. And, um, and this is like a fee, uh, you get this, these pictures are from Kawasaki. That's a very similar disease, but affects children below age of five. And the average age of this um, multi-system inflammatory syndrome is, in, is age eight, so a little bit older kids. And you get this fever um, and then there is an inflammation in multi-organs. So it's in your heart, kidney, lung, of course, a lot of GI, so belly, um, and you get that inflammation. It's kind of a cytokine storm and you have really high, high inflammatory markers, um, you know, and, and fever. And you see this in children, uh, they're, they're, they're usually pretty sick. You know, so these are the sick children, but, but don't, don't, 
Don't think children can get sick. So it's about the skin. Uh, again, the, my message is that there are definitely um, some, some skin manifestations, but they're very sort of diverse. Uh, our, one of our, one of our res, uh, I'm breaking HIPAA here, uh, a close somebody to me uh, um, had COVID and he said he felt like his just skin was tingling and on fire and very, very sensitive. So it was just an in, in, interesting observation. All right, last topic. <laughs> Ask me. Okay, and this is actually me in clinic, um, and then this is one of my patients, and he he uh, consented to use the picture. And this run is a mask, which is pretty giant, but this is a mask where Harkin was sewing for a while, as a, and donated a ton of it to our hospital. So that was a very nice thing, our canvas department. And, and lots of volunteers around the lake in March and April, we were folding these masks. And so that was very nice. Wonderful. So, so what is MASNI? So MASNI is basically any rash that is caused by, by the, uh, the mask. And this is not just acne, although MASNI stands for mask induced acne but it's not just acne and then we are we are like why are we talking about this now because of course like surgeons and healthcare workers we've been wearing masks all our life but it's just the sheer number of people who are wearing masks now and they're dealing with this now it became a <clears throat> much more surface than you asked me when this term was coined I've never heard about MASNI before COVID. So we, this was not in our dermatology textbooks, okay? I think, <laughs> I, I think somebody came up with this and it's a kind of a cute name. But <clears throat> it's, so it's not just acne, but this is actually one of my patient and she has, if you see these little bumps, <clears throat> can be sometimes itchy, like acne or firm. So it looks like a little bit of acne bumps. And this is, this is the most typical picture I see. So this kind of like around the mouth, little bumps, but you also can get a sort of like a chafing kind of irritant dermatitis. And that is very much like, we call it acne mechanica. So, so uh, for example, hockey players, football players, all those people who wear these kind of body armor or helmets can get this type of uh, um, skin inflammation just because of the rubbing and uh, irritation. You also can get allergic contact dermatitis because of the metal part. So some people are allergic to the metal. So if you have something itchy and it's usually itchy, then it's you are truly allergic. So you have to wash, watch, or you're using, people are using these masks and they're using detergents to wash it and you, <clears throat> and you start to get an itchy rash and maybe you're allergic to the, the, to the detergent. <clears throat> and lastly, you can get ingrown hair because, because especially men, you know, with the beard areas, I always tell, tell men that maybe you, if they're really sensitive for ingrown hair, they need to leave their beard a little bit longer, just kind of um, because that will help. But mainly this type of acne comes because of a trapped heat, sweat, and lots of dirt, you know? I mean, it's just like, it occludes the pores, and then it irritates and then it closes uh, acne. So the number one thing, don't just cleanse your, your hands, but you have to cleanse your face now much more often and much more diligently than maybe before. And then you can use some cleansers that <clears throat> have some kind of <coughs> active ingredients like salicylic acid that goes into the pores and, and it's very lip, lipophilic, likes to kind of seeps into the pores and clean, clean those clogged pores. Glycolic acid, that's a gentle exfoliant, so it just helps the skin cells to turn over. Or azelaic acid is my, one of my favorites because it's good for acne, it's antibacterial, and it also helps for people who get brown little spots after acne. So you can even use these gentle facial wipes during the day. So when you feel like, you, you know, carrying your women in your purse and during the day, if you are somebody who wears a mask all day long, just wipe your face, cleanse it during the day, and that will really help. 
And again, uh, you have to use this good light moisturizer, nothing but occlusive, nothing heavy. And then I, another pitch for something like a heart and derm after some, because if it has anti-inflammatory, antioxidant ingredients, that can calm your skin down. And I would say don't use hydrocortisone um, unless you, it's absolutely necessary or steroids if you have a lot of dermatitis because you can get used to it and this can itself can cause acne. So, okay, uh, wash your mask often. Don't wear that mask for months, the same mask because it, you can imagine breathing in and out what's there. And then men, they can use an aftershave um, because again, just protecting your skin and, and putting a light la a layer of moisturizer can really um, help that the mask doesn't rub there. So these are my advice. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and if you follow these, then you can decrease the risk for this masking. Okay, Wonderful. and then my last one is of course, please, please wear your mask. Um, we all know how much um, it really decreases uh, the um, transmission. And that would be it. It's Great. I have to cut my talk a lot, but um, but thanks, Ron. It's just fun as always. Great picture of you and Peter in the DVI. That's a nice picture. Yes, it was one of our favorites. But well, we love it down there. We're very happy. As long as we're on a boat, we're very happy. <laughs> Great. So a uh, couple questions. How many days a year are you on the water now? You're married to, you know, the greatest um, winch maker in the world and hardware maker and Peter's sailing all the time. We've been places together. So tell me, what, what, how many days a year are you guys on the water? Not enough. Um, pick a number. 30, 20, 80, uh, um, Well, I would say maybe uh, all together 30. How many, how many, how much time does it take in the morning when you put on, uh, when you're about to go outside, do you stop and put on some sunscreen then, or had you put it on earlier in the morning? What's your routine? Oh, sunscreen is my, my skincare routine. So I put it on every day. Every day, no matter where you're going to go. Yes, because you get a lot of UVA through the side windows and I have about a good 20 minute ride. So um, I put it even in the winter. And then uh, when you come home, after you've been on, out on a, say, sailing, out of the water, uh, do you then go, well, what is your skin routine when you come home? Okay, so I use a, um, a solution which is glycolic, salicylic, and azelaic acid, or sometimes if I have makeup, I use a, a wipe, a very, actually promoting something here, but called simple. It's a, it's a simple wipe, okay, to remove my makeup if I have makeup. And then I use that solution. Um, and then, you know, I use Hark and Derm. Uh, and then I use, I do use, if we are not on the water, not sailing, then I do use a retinoic acid. So now, uh, different kinds of skin. So I am Scotch, Irish, English, and guess what? Cherokee. On my grandparents' side, both sides, there's Cherokee. Uh, my mom and my mother came from Oklahoma with my grandmother. And um, so my whole life, started sailing as a teeny little boy, I never really used sunscreen. But of course, as I got older, my kids all said, Dad, you've got to use sunscreen like crazy. What I do do is I use lots of moisturizer. And my oldest daughter has said it's one of Dad's rules, moisturize, moisturize, moisturize. So what is the difference between uh, what a moisturizer does is it just puts moisture in your skin, but it doesn't protect. It's not enough is what I'm being told. And that's why I'm changing my habits. So talk to us about the difference between just moisturizing and then having something which does both moisturize and protect. Do you have another R? Because you're asking my favorite questions. So moisturizer is not a... a, a, a a cosmetic chemistry term, okay? Moisturizer is a term which is kind of a, not what we, we use it all the time, but you, we don't put water in the skin, okay? 
first of all, the top layer of the skin, which is cornified layer, that's the brick and mortar. It's extremely lipophilic. No water goes through it. That's well, that's otherwise we would balloon up if we were in you know in the water. So there are three main kind of moisturizers: um, the emollients, the occlusive, and humectants. Okay. The emollients I talked to you about, those are the lipids, you know, this kind of linoleic acid and other lipids which actually go in and build that mortar back. So they, they're lipids, not water. And they replace that glue because it's like a seal. Just think about like a serene wrap, okay? Then there's the occlusive. The most famous occlusive is Vaseline or petrolatum, okay? And that's nothing else but a thick layer of this petrolatum that seals the skin. So it doesn't let anything to leave, doesn't let anything to go in. And most importantly, there is this thing called transepidermal water loss. When you have a damage in your skin, you lose water from inside out, and that's what makes you dry. So what petrolatum does that seals it down, the water kind of gets trapped, so you naturally feel more moisturized. Your skin gets uh, because it keeps that water. The last thing is a humectant. The humectant is like a sponge, okay? And the sponge basically draws in water if there is enough humidity from outside and brings in and basically plumps up the upper layer of the skin. And those are, that's like glycerin is the most famous humectant. And it is, if it's, humectants are perfect if you have enough moisture outside, but maybe in Colorado, those are not the best moisturizers, okay? Because sometimes it can draw water out from inside of your skin. Sorry, I gave you a much more complicated answer that you wanted, but basically <laughs> it is, you, there's many ways to so-called moisturize the skin and, and there is a science behind it. But basically the best moisturizers have all, almost all these ingredients, have a little bit of emollient, a little bit of humectant, maybe, a, maybe some occlusive. You have to be careful with that sometimes, but the best moisturizers have it all. So, Edith Olas Harkin, it's been wonderful having you as a guest on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Uh, you come from a long tradition of really, pardon the term, but brilliant Hungarians. Uh, I'm reminded that Bella Bartok, the musician, George Soros, the financier, Edward Teller, the scientist, and an investor in one of my companies a long time ago, Andy Grove, were all Hungarians, and uh, they all have that fun accent that's uh, so charming. And of course, in terms of women, uh, Zsa, Zsa Gabor, one of the more famous women in history, is also, of course, comes from Hungarian. My grandfather her dated his, her sister. Yeah. Oh, Eva Gabor. No, Magda. Oh, actually. The Gabor sisters, they were very, very famous. Yes. So um, it's wonderful to have someone uh, with such a great, vivacious, and attractive personality and such an incredibly great brain as well. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your charm with us. And uh, we hope that it's helpful for all of our listeners. And um, uh, I'll see you some more on the water in the clubs. And in the meantime, uh, uh, we're going to adjourn the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thank you so much. Eat. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. It was fun. You. See you. Bye. 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 Bye.